Straight to the point, we all know by now that New Vegas can be beaten as a pacifist without attacking a single person. So, you may wonder what the point in the weapon restricted runs is, well I would say it's more about the journey than the destination, but it's also because despite everything, single weapon runs are surprisingly the most requested runs I see in the comments of all my videos. With that in mind, today I decided to tackle what has been the most requested weapon run for New Vegas, as I asked the question, can you beat Fallout New Vegas with only the recharger rifle? For anyone who needs a quick refresher, the recharger rifle initially seems like a good weapon as it has infinite ammo, meaning other than repairs, it's a very affordable weapon. However, it has two major drawbacks, them being its lackluster damage, and the fact that while it may have infinite ammo, it needs to charge up the ability to fire, with each charge taking about a second, and can only have a max of 7 charges at any time. This means firing the weapon wildly will result in a lot of waiting around before you can return fire. Well, with all that out of the way, let's begin. First things first, my special stats are nothing too out of the ordinary for this kind of build. A maxed out perception for the biggest boost of the energy weapon skill right from the start, as well as high intelligence and luck stats for more skill points and level ups and critical chance with the weapon. If the base damage is going to be as low as I believe, then landing crits as much as possible will be the way to go. As for strength and endurance, well the gun has a strength requirement of 5 so that's a given, and then 5 in endurance so I have at least some health for the run. For tag skills I take energy weapons, medicine and repair, which should all be rather self explanatory. Then finally for traits, I just go with nothing. I briefly considered built to destroy for the extra crit chance, but ended up deciding against it as the rifle already has low durability, and what good is extra crit chance if I can't use the thing when it keeps breaking. When it's time to play I use my medicine skill to wrangle some extra heals off the dock, before raiding his house of everything and anything I deemed even slightly useful. My first port of call was Chet, as sometimes he'll have a recharger rifle in stock. Sadly though, today was not one of those days, so off into the Mojave I went to track down my weapon of choice. As usual, my route takes me through Sloan, where I stop to repair the nearby generator and mole rat. Chomps, the man who I still believe should be accountable with a name like that, offers me a reward for my services. But I am frankly insulted by what he offers, and as such, rightfully take what I am owed from the nearby trunks. I then journey through Hidden Valley, the Black Mountain shortcut, most of the desert, and finally make my way to Freeside where I know for certain the weapon I require resides. Thankfully, the thugs in Freeside are slow as well as stupid, so evading them while I make my way to the Van Graffs is as simple as it gets. While paying for goods and services is of course the morally right thing to do, I am about to use one of the worst weapons in the game for an extended period of time, so I will be paying for it tenfold in blood, sweat and tears. That's just an overly complex way of saying I'm dragging the thing to the bathroom and then stealing it. Currently, the weapon does a staggering 7 damage, so with numbers like that on our side, I went back to deal with the thugs in Freeside. It's not really the best way to gauge the effectiveness of the weapon, as after all, their only protection is some torn up clothes. To really see the weapon in action, I offered my services to the king, and decided the best way to finish the quest was by firing multiple lasers straight into Oris. Starting off with a guaranteed crit thanks to stealth was certainly helpful, but after that it was back to the 7 damage wonder as me and Oris battled it out across the street. Luck was on my side here though in many ways. One, that I was able to take cover behind something even stinkier than my weapon, and two, Oris never thought to approach and flank me out of said cover. This resulted in a very long cycle that would start with Oris firing 6 rounds into the dumpster, before having to reload, where I would then pop out, fire as many shots as I could into him, and then retreat to rinse and repeat ad nauseum. This gets me the victory, as well as getting to keep the 200 caps the king provided me for the job. Speaking of the king, I then spent the time to do his talking quest by going back and forward between him, the followers and the NCR until I could bank his favour for later, as well as reach level 5 thanks to the insane amount of experience you get for completing this rather short and simple quest. Not a lot of thought goes into skill points and perks this run, for now energy weapons is my dump stat, and then I just grab any and all perks that increase damage and defence. With the money I've managed to gather thus far, I head over to Mick and Ralph's to repair my recharger rifle to a point where it now does 12 damage. Baby steps I suppose. Anyway, I test it out once more in the locals before deciding to do something good with my time and head back to Good Springs to do the Ghost Town gunfight quest. When using the rifle to shoot the bottles for Sunny, I notice that while she does recognise that I am hitting them, the bottles themselves do not move an inch. If anything, that shows off the stopping power of the gun better than words ever can. Well, I say that, but one sneaky strike is all it takes for me to have to get out the dustpan and brush to sweep Cobb into the nearby bin. For as awful as the weapon can be, it's about on par with most of the starting weapons at level 1, so clearing out the powder gangers isn't an issue. The 100 cap reward from the sole surviving beetle is nice and all, but the real prize is the weapon repair kit that I almost forgot to grab in Victor's shack before I left. 
Apparently, not being content with the righteous slaughter of the gangers attacking Good Springs, I followed the path to Prim, making sure to take out any that I found along the way. As well as Barton Thorne for missing out on the satisfaction of killing him in last week's video. As I am already on the path to the town, I also decide to go and save Prim while I'm in the area. It was around here that I began to appreciate the weapon for what it was. Sure, the damage is crap, let's not get it twisted, but it's not the worst thing in the world for the early game areas on the way to the strip. Plus, specking into a crit focus build seems to make the weapon somewhat viable. We will see if that changes the closer I get to the end of the game though. Anyway, back to the matter at hand, the Bison Steve ends up looking rather dusty by the time I'm finished, and rather than put Prim Slim in charge for like the 100th time, I figured that I could side with the NCR this playthrough, so handing the town over to them wouldn't be the worst idea. Which meant it was off to the Mojave Outpost, and that it was time to become the Ant Bully 2006. The ants really had no chance here, as the crits were just coming in back to back, decimating them before they even had a chance to get me in pinching range. Before making my way back to Jackson for the reward, I made my way up the road killing many jackals and civilians, just to fuel my bloodlust. More importantly, in the town of Nipton is Volpe's in his pack, so naturally, if I'm siding with the NCR, they would have to go. I performed the usual trick of staying at a far enough distance that I could pick a fight with the Legion, before Volpe's left the town hall. Their pointy sticks were of no match to my, and I can't believe I'm saying this, superior firepower. When it came time to take down their leader, I decided to toy with them for a bit. For whatever reason, Vault Bay seems to forgive you indefinitely here, no matter your rep with the Legion. Assuming that is you haven't killed Caesar anyway. So that lets me sneak attack him multiple times and then holster my gun, causing him to limp away like nothing happened. While I was tempted to let him hobble his way back to Caesar like this, I didn't want to leave a job half finished, so I put the last charge in his back before returning to the outpost for my rewards, along with Major Knight and his flawless repair skills. For whatever reason, at this point I had the idea that I wanted to finish the Brotherhood's quest and actually let them side with the NCR at the end of the game for a change. This meant it was off to the crater near Hidden Valley to begin collecting their mission holotapes. The centaurs, evolved normal and mo, were put down with a few lasers to the midsection, allowing me easy access to the dead soldiers. Being in the area, I also decided to head up Black Mountain for the easy experience from the crazy 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 quest. Unlike usual though, I don't have a high enough science skill to repair Rhonda, so it was time to do this the hard way. First up, I outsniped the sniper so I don't get a surprise missile to the back of my head, and then make my way to free Raoul. This then triggers Tabitha to spawn. Her super sledge would have made very short work of me, so I made it the priority to knock it away from her, to make things a bit easier. While this did work, it didn't take her very long to find a suitable replacement. Not helping matters here was the rest of the Nightkin, who suddenly came to her aid as well. Fortunately for me, they won't follow you into any of the nearby buildings, so when I was in a sticky situation, I could just hide in one of them to heal up. At one point I made my way up the tar in the hopes of getting away from them for just a second, but for whatever reason, this caused them all just to book it back down the mountain. By waiting, I was able to get Tabitha to return, thankfully alone this time, so dealing with her was a lot more manageable, and as such, before long, I was victorious. Well, if I was dead certain on starting the Brotherhood quest, the next logical place to go would be Repcon, and like hell I'm waiting for the tour guide to open the doors for me. With the key in hand and a sense of direction, I can be in and out in less than 5 minutes once I find the dead soldiers. The final holotape is outside of Nellis, but if I'm heading there, I may as well cross a few other things off my list of to-dos right now. Firstly, as is the norm, I take out George for 400 caps, and then the druggies for no discernible reason. Getting past the bombardment is just muscle memory to me now, and seeing how I'm going very far in my way to get the Brotherhood to help the NCR, I figured I may as well get the assistance of the other factions as well. First is Argyle's patience, and I will say he seems to be taking their safety a lot more seriously for a change, as he's just casually prancing around the clinic with a missile launcher strapped to his back. Leaving the combat medic behind, I head over to Pete to both listen and question him on his people's history, as well as to steal the nearby snow globe. Next was Jack's love life, as usually I just ignore that one, but I was hoping that I would be able to avoid going to the relay to deal with the ants and the panels. Yet again, more back and forth that would result in the worst quest in the game if we didn't have fast travel. After all my efforts, it turns out in the end it wasn't enough rep with the boomers, so I ended up having to go exterminate more ants anyway. Poor creatures just can't catch a break in these videos. Now it was time to raise the bomber, but before that I grabbed the final Brotherhood hall tape so that they would let me into their secret clubhouse. Without Veronica to vouch for me, I'm collared and put to work as I'm tasked with getting rid of Dobson the Ranger. For the first time in a long time, Dobson was waiting inside his bunker for me, rather than outside near the prison. I thought about smashing the radio with my fist, but figured some people would be annoyed as that's technically not using the recharger rifle, so instead I backed up and shot a hole through it to get the same result. Naturally, this did not please Dobson, and as such it was now a fight to the death. This was basically just a repeat of the fight with Oris from earlier, the only difference being that Dobson had a lot more health, so it wasn't difficult, just a lot more time consuming. On the brightest of sides, this pushed me over the experience threshold, and now I was level 10, meaning it was time to pick up the finesse perk. 
I then reported back to the Brotherhood, who were at the very least happy that I questioned the Ranger before melting him, and after handing the tapes over to the Elder, I was sent on my next task, which was to track down three Brotherhood scouts. Think the previous mission, except this time, they're all still very much alive. The first two are easy enough, as one is two minutes away from the NCRCF, and the other is just outside of Nipton, observing some coyotes I guess. The final scout is right next to Camp Forlorn Hope, so my closest fast travel point is the El Dorado Dry Lake. It's not a huge issue, it just means I've got to spend some time thinking about the local fire breathing and population. I am sure wherever he is, Brian Wilkes would be proud. Not long after this, scout number three was found, and conversed with. With three more scouts done it was back to McNamara, and now it was time for the last, albeit longest part of the quest, finding the three items that he needs from the three different vaults. The Elder really likes the number three. Before I go vault hunting however, it's off to Lake Mead to raise the bomber before I forget. I had a little bit of trouble this time with the Lake Lurks as for whatever reason they were a lot more aggressive than usual, even resulting in my first death. Ironic considering in the last challenge they were completely docile. No matter, attempt number two and I managed to fry some of the fish, but to my disappointment most of them managed to get away when I learned that the laser stops as soon as it hits the water, so I have no way to hurt them while they are submerged. We will just call this a draw I suppose. Anyway, I raised the bomber and rather than head back to the boomers now, decide I will just wait until Crocker asks me to make contact as it saves a trip. Before making my way to the vaults, I sidetracked myself on purpose for once as I head for Novak to see about getting myself a first recon beret for the extra crit chance that it provides. Initially I was going to go along with Boone's side quest and just leave once he gave me his, but like most situations in this video I wished to solve it with the recharger rifle if possible, so to that end I snuck into Manny's room under the cover of darkness and melted his brains. With some new fashion and a higher crit chance to boot, now it was time to explore the vaults. I am going to go over the vaults pretty fast as I didn't bother with any of the quests tied to them, it was simply get in, kill whatever was in my way, grab the parts and then leave. First on the chopping block was Vault 11, as from personal experience it is usually the easiest of the bunch. To spice things up just a little bit, a band of legion assassins ambushed me in the vault entrance. I tried my best to fend them off, but they were much better outfitted than I was, so after a very short battle I retreated into the vault in hopes of healing up, or at the very least that the rats and mantises would maybe distract them. Turns out this was the right move, not for the aforementioned reasons, but as it turns out, they will not follow you inside, so I was free to wipe out the rats and bugs at my own pace. As I said, the enemies here are about as weak as they come, it's more about the story you can piece together for this vault. Shame I don't really care about that today though, so after getting tossed around by some explosive traps for a bit, I grabbed the part I need and was on my way. If you are wondering about the assassins outside, don't. They all despawned and were nowhere to be found when I left. I then briefly went on some adventures in Boulder City that resulted in me saving the cans with the power of money like a real hero. I then immediately recouped those losses by snagging another snow globe from Hoover Dam. Logically, the next vault was Vault 3, as it is closer and a lot simpler than Vault 22. While they are numerous, the combined efforts of the fiends outside the vault were not enough to slow me down. I figured they may have a high resistance to energy weapons for no other reason than they tend to carry a lot of laser guns, but that did not seem to be the case, unfortunately for them. In the vault I convinced them I was a drug runner so I could just skip my way all the way down to Motor Runner and save myself the trouble of navigating the long way through the vault. Another bonus of doing things this way is that with Motor Runner being docile I can sneak up behind him for a guaranteed critical. While the damage inflicted wasn't great, it seems to have fried his brain to some degree as from this point he just stood and watched as I fired shot after shot into his head until he was vaporised. Fighting his guards after was a little awkward. Not because it was difficult, but due to the fact I had to stand around this corner while they stabbed me as I waited for my weapon to recharge. It's not long till they are out for the count as well, I grabbed the reverse pulse cleaner and just ran out of there and onto the final vault. The journey to 22 for once was free of danger which was a welcome change, so all I had to contend with were the green trogs in and around the vault. Of course this vault can take forever if you aren't prepared, luckily I planned on coming here pretty early into the run, so I made sure to have a high enough repair skill to fix up the elevator to make my life just a little easier. The spore carriers in all honesty are quite easy to deal with. Sure they can hurt if they get up close, but if you know where they spawn then you can get enough shots in to either severely hurt or straight up kill them before that happens. As I am just rushing through here, that does mean I never even bothered to find Keeley. Oh well, after grabbing the last of the parts it's back once again to the Brotherhood where I can help fix the air conditioning unit and for some reason the game fades to black. Believe it or not, accomplishing all of those tasks was still not enough to make me a member of the Brotherhood, but instead the final mission, and the simplest, is what finally pushes them over the edge to accept me as one of their own. Simply put, all I must do is make my way back up Black Mountain and install a signal transmitter into one of the consoles. I could imagine this would be a bit of an issue, but thanks to having already been there, there are no nightkin to slow me down, and as such I am back in the bunker in no time at all. 
Finally, I have finished the Brotherhood questline, allowing them to strike a truce with the NCR, as well as gaining power armor training. The power armor is a little overkill, especially considering I haven't even properly reached Benny yet, but it is rare for me to gain access to it in New Vegas runs, so with that in mind, I went straight to the Quartermaster and bought myself a non-faction set of T-51B. As ready as I could ever be, and then some, it was off to the Strip. Benny and House are of course my primary concerns on the Strip, but let's not kid ourselves here, it's a weapon restricted run, and I just got access to a suit of armour that makes me laugh at small arms fire. You know what that means, it's time for a good old Nurbit murder montage in Gamora. After that it was down to the tops where I used my charm to butter up Swank to the point where he not only gave me my weapons back and called off the guards, but also sent Benny up to his room alone where I then pulled the old switcheroo on him by shooting him in the head instead. Just like me, that wasn't enough to put him in the ground, so a few more lasers would have to suffice before he transformed into a dust bunny. With my business in the tops having gone exactly as planned, it was off to meet with Crocker and begin the NCR's questline. First, he sends me to gain the service of the boomers, obviously before that I walk into the Lucky 38, hand over all of the snow globes I've collected up until this point, and then just casually saunter into House's private chambers as his Securitrons watch in horror as I ignore their assault. House has the structural integrity of a single strand of uncooked spaghetti, so I take him out before he even gets a chance to finish his fancy animation. Back to the main story, I return to Nellis and thanks to an increased repair skill, finally fixed up those solar panels for some extra XP and managed to reach level 16. This is very important for the build, as I can now take the better criticals perk just to give my weapon a little extra oomph. After discussing the situation with Pearl and guaranteeing their aid, it's back to Crocker who wants me to solve the issues in Freeside, which I also did earlier, so one round trip to the King and I'm finished with the Ambassador and can move on to the big boy quest at the Dam. To be honest, the only faction quest I actually have to finish is dealing with the Cans. Much like with the Boomers and Brotherhood, I figured it was time I brought the Cans onto the side of the NCR rather than wiping them all out for a change. After the disintegration of an entire family line of Bighorners, I met up with Papa, who was not best pleased with helping the people who killed not just the men, but the women and the children of his tribe. Thankfully Regis, his right hand man, comes out and says pretty clearly that if he was in charge, he would support the NCR. With this information I contact the Colonel, who likes the idea so much she promotes me to political assassin and tasks me with taking out the Big Cheese. Initially I was concerned how this would work, as there was no way the recharger rifle would one shot Papa Khan, regardless of a crit. And I was right. That said, just like before with Volpace, after shooting him once, I can holster my gun and he will stop attacking and just go back to bed. He doesn't heal straight away either, so I can then follow up with a second sneak attack and put him down for a more permanent snooze. With no one the wiser, Regis agrees to help out and thanks to all my previous efforts, I can now move on to protecting the president. We all know how this goes by now, you either pickpocket the detonator from one of the assassins or take out the one posing as the sniper and then wait for Kimball to run to safety. This time I chose to take out the sniper as it made me feel a little bit more involved than just ruffling around in a stranger's pockets. Never did actually see the Legion Poison of the Engineer, which was odd. No time to worry about that as it was time for the Battle of Hoover Dam. When I meet the General I once again level up, this time to level 18 and therefore can grab another perk. To mix things up a bit I opted to take a perk I'd never chosen before, that being the Meltdown perk, and to say that it helped out a great deal with crossing the dam would be quite an understatement. I really wish I had access to this perk earlier. Things get more interesting when I face down the Legate. Naturally, I try to fight him with the full force of the Legion at his back. Even with all the perks I have, including Meltdown and better criticals, this just didn't seem feasible outside of spamming stim packs the entire time. Let's just say I dared to oppose the might of the Imperial Legion and paid dearly for it. I had a backup plan for this of course, and it was to challenge the Legate to a duel instead. This makes the fight a lot more manageable as now I only have to deal with him and not 10 other people breathing down my neck. That's not to say it was easy though. I still had to use a majority of the medical supplies at my disposal, not helping matters was that I forgot to take the perk that makes you immune to melee knockdowns, meaning the leg it got to knock me around for a large portion of the fight. At one point I figured I'd outsmarted him by having the high ground, but the leg it is always prepared for my bullshit and as such pulled out his own gun to return fire. Not to mention he also decided to just dip from the battle momentarily by casually phasing out through the front gate. Thankfully he did come back to continue the fight so my time wasn't wasted. Speaking of the fight it lasted around 8 minutes, but to me it definitely felt a lot longer. In the end I got one last critical on him wiping any trace of Lanius off the face of the Mojave, taking my trophies from his ashes, speaking with Oliver, ending the game and proving yes you can indeed beat Fallout New Vegas 
with only a recharger rifle. Well that was a bit of an oddly paced run. The start was a little bit slow just getting the gun, but once I got the right perks, things seemed to really pick up all the way to the Legate fight, where it then ground to a halt. Regardless, that's going to be in this challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving a video a like, interest in more challenges in the future. Feel free to subscribe to turn on this video every week. My name is Nerbert. Thanks everyone. I'll see y'all in the next video.